Hi, my name's Scott Turkington, and this is my cousin Charles Anderson. Charlie's work in the alternative fuels industry has taken us all over the world. With my camera in hand, we travel the globe searching for new technologies and locations to explore. Stay tuned because you never know where we'll be or what in the world we'll discover next. The beauty of the drive north the day before to Chena Hot Springs reminded Charlie, Matt, and I just how much we love Alaska. Alaska has always been a destination for people with a desire for wide open spaces and new experiences. Even before Alaska's statehood in 1959, our grandparents over 60 years ago began their journey to the last frontier for these same reasons. But years before our family's adventures to the 49th state began, two brothers already in Alaska looking for gold set out on an adventure of their own. In 1905, brothers Robert and Thomas Swan set out to locate the source of the steam seen by a U.S. Geological Survey crew the year before on the Upper Chena River. A month after leaving Fairbanks, their search ended when they finally located the hot springs on August 5, 1905. After being privatized as a patented homestead in 1920, Chena Hot Springs changed ownership a number of times over the next several decades until it was purchased by Bernie and Connie Carl in 1998. At that time the resort was in disrepair and losing money so Bernie and Connie began looking at using the natural resources around Chena Hot Springs to help reduce the costs associated with running the resort. In just a few short years, Chena Hot Springs has come up with some very unique solutions to meet the needs of the guests and employees of the resort. Some of these projects are the first of their kind in the world, and many make use of the natural hot water found on site. Here we are at the entrance of Chena Hot Springs Resort, one of Alaska's most unique places to visit. Not only are there hot springs that you can soak in, but the geothermal resources here play a vital role in the day-to-day -day life of the people that live here at Chena and the people that visit here. Whether it's the geothermally heated greenhouses where the restaurant gets its produce or the heat that you have for your hotel room or the electricity that you're using, everything is generated by the geothermal resources here. So Gwen's going to take us on a personal tour and we're going to learn a little bit more about what goes on here at Chena Hot Springs. Come on and let's take a look. Chena Chiller. This is what is making power for the resort right now. It's how we're turning our lights on. We're using hot water from one of our geothermal wells uh, to basically make power. Uh, tell me a little more about this Pure Cycle and, and your development uh, here at Chena with that. Okay. Um, the Pure Cycle is uh, it's an organic Rankine Cycle device. So it, it um, basically uses um, what most people know of as a refrigeration cycle and it runs that refrigeration cycle in reverse. So in a normal refrigeration cycle, you take electrical power and you create cooling. In the reverse, or the, in the Rankine cycle, we use heat to generate electrical power by running that cycle backwards. Um, we developed that, like I said, for waste heat, and, uh, and now we're applying it to geothermal power production. We've got hot water coming in right here. It's uh, coming about 3,000 feet from our main production well. And it's going into this evaporator right here. And it's boiling a refrigerant that we have in here into a vapor. And the reason we have to use a refrigerant here is because our water is 165 degrees Fahrenheit. It's not hot enough to generate steam. It doesn't boil. And so what we need to do is we need to find a liquid that's going to boil at a lower boiling point than water is. And in this case, we found a Freon 134A. It's a very common refrigerant. It's what you use in your, in your car air conditioning system or in your home. It's pretty environmentally safe and we're, that's what we're using for this system. So this refrigerant is boiled into a vapor here in this, in this evaporator with hot water coming in from the geothermal well. The vapor goes up through this tube here, this pipe, over to the turbine. It spins the turbine blades, which then turns the generator and that's what generates our power. 
And one of the big advantages we have here is we've got a really great cold water resource. We're in Alaska. We're not out in a desert in Nevada or something like that. We've got nice cold water here. We're getting it from a well that's a, about 2,000 feet away from here. We're bringing it down here in a pipeline, and it's coming into this condenser unit right here. Once this refrigerant vapor goes through this turbine, it comes into the condenser and it recondenses back into a liquid. After that, it runs through this pump right here, this blue pump right next to the unit, right below it, and it's pumped back over to the evaporator and it starts to cycle over again. The other thing that we have here is we've got the hot water reinjection system. We've got the hot water, it's coming in through this top pipe right here. It's running through the evaporator side like I showed you earlier, and then it's coming back through this pipe here, this lower one, and this is the reinjection portion of the system. Reinjection is super critical to any kind of a geothermal power plant. It's the one variable that we really have control over. And so that's what we're looking at really closely right now. The geothermal generator project at China Hot Springs Resort was nothing short of astounding. They're producing enough 100% green electricity to power their entire resort. This is no small accomplishment considering before bringing the geothermal generator online, they were spending hundreds of thousands of dollars a year powering the resort with very loud diesel generators. That sucker's working hard! If China Hot Springs was still powering their resort with diesel generators, Charlie could have improved their situation by converting them to run on waste vegetable oil. But with an endless supply of hot water, this generator, unlike solar, which requires sun, and wind power that requires wind, will run 24-7 as long as the water stays hot and flowing. This is as green as it gets. Coming up after the break, we head out into the field with geologists. We also encounter a rare hairy mammal while soaking in the hot springs. Stay tuned because you never know what in the world we'll discover next. Would you like to drive a car that's better for the environment, uses a fuel produced domestically, and the fuel it does use can be had for free? Amazingly, this is all possible thanks to your local restaurants and grocery stores which throw away millions of gallons of used cooking oil every year. Every few weeks, we'll be giving away our three DVD box set on powering your vehicle on waste vegetable oil to one of our lucky subscribers. Subscribe today and keep watching our latest episode for your chance to win. Before the break, Gwen Holdman showed us how China Hot Springs' new geothermal generator works. Hot water, the key to making the whole power generation cycle work, must be re-injected back into the ground to be reheated and start the entire cycle over again. We headed outside to meet up with Dick Benoit, the geologist in charge of monitoring the geothermal well, to find out more about the whole reinjection process. See this little cap tubing here? It's got a hole in the middle. Okay. This goes down about 200 feet in this well. We got just a little piece of pipe hanging down there that's full of nitrogen gas. We can pump nitrogen gas through this here, you know, by opening and closing the valve, put it out, and so we just sort of measure the weight pushing down on this chamber. It's open at the bottom, so this is the way that's going to tell me where the water level is in this well and how much that water level has moved up and down as we've flowed wells and injected into wells. Well, so what type of depths and temperatures are we looking at with this one, and what types of depths and temperatures do you normally see? Well, f for normal power generation, you're looking at temperatures over 300 degrees F, and of course the hotter, the better. Uh, this well here that, that we're in is 165 degrees F. The hottest temperature we've measured at China is 176 degrees Fahrenheit, so we are making uh, electricity here with the lowest temperature water uh, possibly in the world right now. There we go. How does the wildlife react with the, the hot water? Do they do they utilize well, it and like it? or? Well, the moose love these ponds. You know, there's uh, moose, what, moose moss or something yeah. to, to munch down in the bottoms of these ponds. So almost every day you'll see uh, a moose in here. Yesterday we had a, uh, a moose and uh, two calves uh, further west in a pond there. And they're eating away and a beaver walks out of the creek here walks across the grass, jumps in the ponds, and the moose take off. They didn't, they didn't want to share the pond <laughs> yeah, with the beaver. In 100 years, if you can operate the field such that you can serve the water, and the field is relatively full, then you can sit there and give it 30 years 
to rewarm, and you can start to do the whole thing over again. But if you have stripped it of its water, it may take nature 5,000 years to refill, that to refill it up. The water is the limiting factor. So reinjection is important. That's the only thing that we control. The size of the field's already fixed. The volume of water in it's fixed. The chemistry's fixed. The amount of heat stored in the rocks and the water is fixed. I can't do anything about those. Right. But I can say, all right, we're going to put so much water back underground here or here or here. Yeah. That's what resource management is. What we've just learned is that with careful management of the hot water located beneath China Hot Springs Resort, this resource should last for many years to come. The most amazing aspect of this entire project is that they're producing geothermal electricity from what could possibly be the coldest temperature water in the world. We wanted to know what the long-term effects of this project will be not only for China Hot Springs Resort, but also for the rest of the world. To find out, we headed over with Gwyn to talk to David Blackwell, another geologist working on this project. If we can take 165 degrees water and make power from it, then we can just take hot water that's actually a waste, a lot of oil wells, and put geothermal power plants all over the country. So they're producing water They're producing the water. 12 billion barrels of waste water a year. That's a lot of water. That's a lot of water. And then they're already injecting a lot of that back into the... They just the put it back in the ground. And they have to pay to put it back in the ground. So you so can just they, add a power plant. Add a power plant, plant, and what's a waste suddenly becomes green power. So how much power do you think we can produce that? You think it'd be five to 10,000 megawatts. That's, a, that's like the equivalent of like five nuclear power plants. Five nuclear power plants, five right, power. right. <clears throat> With no pollution and, and uh, basically no emissions. So that's, that's what's neat about China, is it, it could be the, the forerunner of big things for geothermal. Our first day at China had been very productive, but it was getting late. Even though there's so much more to discover at the resort, we needed to switch gears and work on the other project that had brought us here. We had been invited to China to not only document the grand unveiling of the geothermal power plant at their first annual alternative energy fair tomorrow, but also to convert Gwen's diesel Jeep Liberty to run on waste vegetable oil. Before pulling an all-nighter to get the conversion finished by tomorrow afternoon, there was one thing we had been dying to do since we first knew about our trip to this amazing, one-of-a-kind destination. Soak in the hot springs. Spa can. Spa can. I just got more water up my nose. <laughs> Thanks for a rock to beat myself. Oh. Yes. <laughs> nice. All right, here we are at Chino Hot Springs. Apparently, as legend would have it, there's a certain hairy mammal that frequents these hot springs. It's very rarely seen, but if we're very quiet, we might see this animal breach. It was time to get out of the hot springs and get to work on Gwen's vehicle. The energy fair was tomorrow and her rig has to be running on veggie by then. Working in an unfamiliar shop with limited tools and no extra parts, we're going to have to get really creative. I've seen Charlie pull off some pretty challenging installs before, but we're both having our doubts this one will be done in time. <laughs> I don't want to do this. Gwen, are you nervous? Am I nervous? Yeah. Well, this is kind of cool to watch the master at work here, you know? Oh, okay. On next week's episode of What in the World, will we get Gwen's Diesel Jeep Liberty converted to run on waste vegetable oil in time for the grand unveiling of the geothermal generator? Up in Fairbanks without all your tools. I know. Just... It's alright. It's what we thrive on. Jeez, turn it off, turn it off, turn it off. We also speak with owner Bernie Carl, Senator Ted Stevens, and Governor Frank Murkowski we also take a look at two more green projects, a greenhouse which can grow food even in the dead of winter, and an ice palace cooled below freezing even in the heat of summer. So stay tuned because you never know what in the world we'll discover next.